press the bell icon on the YouTube app to never miss a video from News Laundry. Welcome to this special webinar on News Laundry. Uh, we are here to discuss the public-private partnerships that seem uh, necessitated out of the COVID crisis that has hit the world. And we have an extremely eminent panel joining us. And first of all, thank you all for making the time because I'm thrilled that we have such a star panelist, uh, such star panelists here. So before I set the context of the discussion, let me just introduce the panel. Uh, we have Dr. Naresh Trehan. He is one of the world's most well-known cardiovascular and cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, he is the chairman and managing director of Medanta Hospitals. He's received a Padma and a Padma Shri uh, in 1991 and 2001. Thank you, Dr. Trehan, for making the time. I know it's a busy time for you. Pleasure, pleasure. Then we have a former Secretary of Health, K. Sujata Rao. She, in fact, also uh, got a degree from Harvard in public administration. Is that right, ma'am? It's a first class master's in public administration from Harvard University? Yes. So um, you have had a long and illustrious career with the government. Uh, thank you for joining us and making the time. You're also a columnist for the Indian Express. Thank you. And finally, joining us from the Observer Research Foundation is Umen C. Kurian. Welcome, Umen. You're a senior fellow and the head of health initiative at ORF. Uh, you're working on public health. You have re you've trained uh, as, uh, in research in economics and community health from Jawaharlal Nehru University. You worked for Oxfam, ActionAid, the Center for Inquiry into Health, and Allied Themes. So you've had an illustrious career as well. Thank you all. Dr. Trehan, let me start with you because you, you're seeing this up front on the front lines. Um, Abe, you know, before we move into the PPP, how bad is the situation? Is it not as bad as expected? Because I was watching Boris Johnson's uh, address to his nation. And he was saying that we still have whatever few thousand empty beds. So we are equipped and it didn't hit us as hard as we had expected it to, which is a good thing. Here, do we still have excess capacity? Has it not hit us that hard? And is that reason to feel a little satisfied or is the worst to come? Okay, so in the view of the lockdown, which was obviously a very good thing to do, and the fact that it was extended, it has mitigated the speed with which the virus is spread, spreading, because that was the whole idea, to break the chain of spread. So now if you look at, we are 30,000 plus cases, uh, which is not for a country like ours, which is uh, over 1.3 billion people, that we are talking about a minuscule number of people have been have tested positive. Now, one thing is that there has been limited testing, so obviously they, we expect that there are many more, than, than we, we see. But if you go from the other end, that we have created now COVID hospitals. COVID hospitals are in every district now. So you take the example of Gurugram. We have two government hospitals that are COVID hospitals, the civil hospital, and they have taken over the ESIC hospital. And we, from Medanta, Portis, and Artemis, we have collectively adopted a hospital in Manesa to make it a COVID hospital for public use. So the whole thing is that we, this is a, a quasi PPP model because we are going to run it, we are going to finance it, we are not expecting anything from the government except some help in getting PPEs and masks and all that which are in short supply which the government have access to. That's, that's a separate issue. But beyond that, it is by and large our effort to give back like you, you can say CSR, you can call it whatever you want to call, but it, we, are, we, we think that when the whole surge comes, we will need that many beds at least. Now, if it is measured, this is enough. These 300 beds that we have in Gurugram district should be enough at the, the way things are, because there are two things again that have happened. A lot of our, our people who have got infected, who have tested positive, are actually very mildly symptomatic or not symptomatic at all. So if that is the case, a large number of them can be kept at home uh, isolation 
or in, in facilities which are isolation facilities rather than hospital beds. So the government has actually issued the protocol for that and that's a good help because in case the demand on beds goes up like happened in New York, you never know what's going to happen by the way. Once we lift the lid, we, 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 it will work through, through society, it has to. So we will have many, many more cases than we, than we have today. But at the same time, if we add up the facilities of quarantine, isolation and hospital beds, this lockdown period has given us enough time to be prepared at least for a medium-sized surge. Now, what happens when the, when the lockdown is lifted? and how it is lifted, which is the key. As important as lockdown was, even more important is in what sequence and in what manner is it lifted. So uh, just quickly before I move on to Ms. Rao, this hospital that you and two other entities have set up, three pri private parties, how is the pricing of this? In the sense like the government hospital that is you know, being treated by COVID, I'm assuming other than the disposables, which I guess you have to still purchase in many hospitals yeah, yeah. legally. How does it work in this particular hospital? You know, just to add to what the expenses are, really, you know what you have to do to the staff because of the fact that they have to work in close proximity to COVID right. patients. They work for two weeks and then we uh, rest them for two weeks. Because it, so, that, so that's the big expense. And protecting them with PPEs, which is an expensive proposition, but also we are 100% we are that we should provide the best PPEs to that. The second thing is that there will be insured patients. There will be patients who have some, some sort of scheme from to which they belong. So if that is the case, fine. But if there are poor patients who have nothing, then they'll be treated free. So there will be no discrimination from that point of view. But if whatever they carry, if they can pay on their own, that's fine. If, they, if they're covered, they're covered. And the rates, by the way, the rates don't cover the costs today because in an average, in a private hospital, it, to man, maintain a bed and have a patient in it and treat them, it is about three and a half to four lakhs per month per bed, the cost. Over here, for a, to take care of a COVID patient, it's seven lakhs a month. So it's almost double. So right. the, the, whatever income we have, we will not be covered by that. But then we also have a group which is known as the Guru Gram COVID Volunteers. These are people who have under the McKinsey is the backbone which has organized this group and we all are on it. And we are raising funds to also do the gap funding and all that because we don't know how long it will go. Yes, in so fact, we are providing the staffs free. We are providing the medicines and all that other stuff from our hospitals. And then in, in addition to that, if there is gap funding required, we will go, we'll go to our friends yes, and, and CSR, has... CSR fund. So that's yes. how we plan to fund it. But to answer your question, Will the poor people be serviced? Yes. So uh, clearly this COVID, I mean, I've seen this in the case of medicine, you know, Dr. Trihan just told us, I've seen in my neighborhoods and in my network, people actually getting together to collect funds to feed people who are starving and, you know, the migrant labor left. Mr. Rao, if I can come to you now. Um, I, um, and I understand, you know, you've been with the government, Dr. Trihan is, you know, very well known and high profile doctor who also, I'm sure is on a lot of advisory boards for the government as well. There are three parties involved here, the government, you know, the hospital and the janta. I, in my early avatar as a producer, have worked with the government. I have done jobs for the government and to get the payment out, I swore I'd never work with the government. So there are, there are three deficits I mean, I, I, and, I, and I've worked with the worst paymasters. But when we had, I mean, we did two jobs for the government and mera tel nikal gaya, paise nikalte hue. So, while I understand people may be meaning well, they may want to do something. Before we get to how the janta perceives it, how does the dynamic between government and private hospitals work? You have held such a high profile post. What did you see of it and what are the shortcomings of this model? Well, you know, in the context of uh, COVID, I would like to, uh, I mean, that's what I think we're starting the discussion with, is that, you know, it's a completely the responsibility of the government. Let's make it very clear that when it comes to infectious diseases, it's a public good and it is something that the government is completely responsible for, whether the central government or state, it's a concurrent subject. So it, is, uh, it has to be able to uh, you know, uh, discharge all the functions of uh, ensuring population health and reduce infections and so on. 
and taking the private sector wherever it's possible. As you've seen, the private sector has its own uh, uh, issues and problems. It cannot work on a charity basis for too long. Uh, they can do one-off here or there, but it's not possible for them to, uh, to be able to serve, service, you know, get, set aside their whole hospital for COVID patients and so on. So right now, in some states, I think they even uh, took over some hospitals, I'm told. I don't necessarily buy that. I really feel that whatever facilities the government has, we should exploit them fully. Right now, I think the epidemic is very much under control. 30,000 cases is not very difficult to manage. Uh, out of those 33,000, 80% can be uh, uh, you know, are mild and they don't need very complicated uh, treatment. It is that 5% which require ICU treatment ventilators, that is where the challenge is. Getting the enough of ICU beds and enough of uh, uh, the blood supply and whatever uh, the, uh, the requirements, that infrastructure that's needed for those 5%. And that's where the government is weak. So I feel that, uh, you know, in places like Bombay and Delhi, where you have a very vibrant and a very strong private sector, uh, where ICU, if, if, but God forbid, if uh, this, uh, uh, you know, COVID uh, uh, caseloads increase much more, and we are stuck with these uh, elderly populations or people who need ICU treatment, we may have to call upon the private sector to help out. And as Dr. Trehan has said, yes, it's going to cost them double the amount of money because the amount of um, uh, care they'll have to take to keep it infection-free and to keep, uh, provide the PPE kits, everything is doubled. Uh, so that kind of money, I think uh, it's very important that the government really negotiates, makes a package, negotiates with the private sector a fair uh, um, uh, rate and gets into uh, an agreement with them and, uh, and you know, uh, fund for it. I believe that government must pay for the services that, uh, uh, that have to be provided by the, um, by the private sector in this regard. Uh, but how, would, also, how, would you, how would you price that? Uh, you know, uh, before you answer... You know, I, no, I, just I, one I, minute. I'll give you some data, ma'am. One, one, one minute. One minute. Let me capital. finish. Yeah. So what I also want to say is, given the extraordinary nature of this epidemic, it's extraordinary. I've never seen it in my lifetime. I don't think Dr. Trehan uh, has seen it in his. None of us have. We also expect that the private sector is not going to be making money on this, not be doing profit. They'll give you at a no-cost, no-profit basis. That is their social accountability. That is their payback to society. They cannot get into a loss, not below margin profit, but they certainly can do it at a reasonable rate. And that should then become a win-win situation. How did you do that when you were with the government? How do you ensure that balance? Because the logic of the market will want to maximize you know, profit. While I understand that, it, it really depends on organization to organization but if you just see i i i don't that's what i that's why i wanted to intervene before you spoke i don't believe that this is a situation where private sector should want to be doing profit maximization they have to turn their hat on to the welfare part of it they have to i i don't say that i don't think that it's a sustainable solution for government to say provide free no, you can't. That I understand. Maybe 10, maybe 20, but they cannot for all time be providing free ICU treatment to patients. No, they cannot. But the point is they can come with a fair rate, uh, which will have to be worked out and negotiated. I mean, after all, if we can come up with proper treatment protocols and then they work out the cost, how much it will uh, you know, need to be charged. But I would expect uh, that the private sector would not uh, at this moment, when we are the country is in such a bad shape, in such a bad shape, be thinking of profit maximization. This is not a time when you make profits. And I think the private sector is also going to respond like that when and if the government calls upon them to help us out in this crisis. But the primary responsibility, I'm afraid, will have to be the government's. Uh, but as I said, it is in the ICU beds, it is in the 5% patients that the government is very, very weak and that's where they will necessarily if if the caseloads go beyond our capacity they will have, have to, to look price. upon the private sector to help out the private sector needs to help out because it's not their case either to stand on oh. say that we are not making profit so we are not going to come because tomorrow the people's anger will be so much 
that I don't think they will but be able to survive. Yeah. You know, there is a certain social accountability aspects that come in also. So, Uman, uh, before I come to you, I just want to put this data out. And since you do work with a think tank, and I'm sure you're academically very sound, uh, this is the data that this Princeton study, uh, you know, by Geetanjali Kapoor, Alti Sriram, Jyoti Joshi, Arindam Nandi, and Ramana Lakshmi Narayan came up with. It's called COVID-19 in India, state-wise estimates of current hospital beds, intensive care units, beds and ventilators. And this uh, has been done, you know, partnership with the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy and the Princeton University. So here's the data that we have. India has 0.7 hospital beds and 0.8 physicians for every thousand people. A Brookings Institution's US-based policy organization estimates that India has 0.55 beds available in government hospitals per thousand population. I could go on. There's another uh, survey conducted by Fiki shows that nursing homes and private hospitals comprise comprise 60% of the beds in India at 8.5 to 9 lakh and 80% of the doctors of India and cater to 60% of Indian patients. So this is what the private sector is actually catering to. So while Ms. Rao, I, you know, I understand that that's what should happen, but this is what is happening in such a situation. And you know, there are numbers. I recommend people go online and look at this report. What are the models that other countries follow? And because you may have studied this in some detail, this trust deficit, I'm sure it exists and maybe our panelists are too polite to say so, but I can tell you as a producer it existed with me. I had sworn I'd never work with the government. And similarly, profiteering is a fact. I mean, we have just come up with a case and ICMR has denied it. There are various news organizations working on it. That was a batch of, uh, I think it was PPE kits and not tests, which and it only came to light because the case went to the high court. And the two private parties were battling over how it should be priced. And the government had paid double the price, and now they've backed back. The um, floor is yours, Uman. Thanks, uh, Abhinandan. Um, I think uh, the healthcare policy debate is often very polarized in India. Too polarized, in fact, to be of much use to the public. Uh, uh, the thing is, we, uh, we do have an uh, infrastructure deficit in the public sector. It is also a fact that we have been extremely lucky the way COVID has progressed in India. Uh, initial uh, uh, estimates, initial projections have been proven wrong. We started this uh, lockdown pretty early. So that has uh, 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 controlled the spread to an extent. Many people say that BCG might have uh, 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 some uh, hand in, in, in the spread being slow. Many people say that the temper high temperature Temperature is uh, slowing it down, but whatever be the case, the spread has been slow. The number of deaths have been slow. So the tendency to say that the COVID response is led by the public sector now, both testing and treatment, and the private sector is deliberately punching below its weight, it may be empirically true for now. But that doesn't mean that we can win this battle through public sector alone. As you said. The, the numbers are not on our, on our, on our table. So uh, uh, right now, uh, I mean, there has been extreme panic in the beginning. Many private hospitals were shut. Uh, the footfall to these hospitals uh, got reduced. So, but, but as we go back from this lockdown, step by step, many of these hospitals will come online. The PPE uh, supply will uh, improve. So uh, 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 we have a very uh, lightly regulated healthcare sector. That is a fact. It's but very it's lightly also regulated, you're saying? Lightly, lightly, very oh. lightly, light regulation. Uh, but it is also a fact that there are uh, public-private partnerships, uh, ongoing public-private partnerships, which can be leveraged uh, uh, to fit our, our needs for the COVID response. Uh, for example, we have, uh, we have had a history of uh, uh, various uh, health insurance uh, uh, models which tapped into both public and private sector bed capacity. My uh, uh, recommendation would be uh, there are uh, many, many initiatives like uh, Dr. Rehan and friends are doing in Gurugram. There are other uh, facilities going up across the country. So we have a PMJY covering 50-60% of our population. 
maybe i mean they could fast track uh, empanelment of these facilities uh, into pmjy so that some uh, uh, money is channelized into this hospital i mean they will need money and most of these fac new facilities that will spring up because of voluntary uh, contributions of uh, organizations and individuals they may not have the kind of resources that uh, the gurugram facility might have so uh, we have to plow in uh, 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 resources to these uh, facilities with with uh, with i mean with with any and every channel that is possible we have uh, pmjy for example with uh, which covers around 50 to 60% of the indian population but this crisis gives us an opportunity with 90% workers in the informal sector we have an opportunity to ramp up our social protection systems now uh, perhaps it's a good time to make pmjy universal it is already available for free to 60% it can be expanded to the non poor on a premium based uh, 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 so premium just, payment basis uh, how would the the, the pmj i guess you the pradhan mantri uh, pradhan um, mantri jan arogya yojana jan arogya yojana now pmj why how does it really fit in if you were to explain to a lay person the economics of it how does it fit in to make sure that private hospitals don't end up making a loss uh, yet it is affordable for those who fall ill how does the mechanics actually work uh, abhinandan there is uh, there is a problem with the public debate around this uh, many people many organizations even the supreme court seems to have been uh, misguided the supreme court judgment that the tests uh, have to be free it in a way ignored the fact that tests are already on paper free for 60% of indians through pmjy pmjy had made tests and treatment free for covid so it is there is no charges at the point of use point of care for 60% of indians already so it is we are talking about the rest of the 40% some of them may be able to pay uh, but uh, the, the many of these 40% are from the lower middle class and poor households who are unfortunately not on the pmjy wear rolls so my suggestion is to make it universal make it free for everybody for a year and channel whatever voluntary contributions government contributions csr contributions bring in a india health solidarity fund and fund everything it is the pm cares fund i mean we don't know what's yes, happening yes, but money yes. it exists i mean it, it needs to be streamlined we have just, to be but, but just so i'm clear when you say it's free it's free for the user but yeah. yet the government is paying the lab or the hospital for that yes test. yes just so that yes. we keep on that yes absolutely so i i think that's an important point you've made but um how how does the partnership actually work if we were to make it work at a treatment level now uh i mean it, what it, is it, the trust deficits what are the experiences that you may have had from studying other countries like in countries where the government has taken over private hospitals how smooth is that relationship no, that is all firefighting i'm uh, uh, all the countries are firefighting now fortunately we have a system that partially works the problem with pmjy is that many private hospitals get paid pretty late so we can we can fast track things it's a national emergency so for a year it should be free and the payments should be smoother than they usually are the babus will have to step up so to speak okay uh, if i could come to you dr trehan um the, the the trust deficit i understand that you know um like uh, uman said that you know the government would have to step up and make sure that it's efficient there are two questions specific questions i have and then you can maybe react to what the rest of the panelists said a while uman pointed out very importantly that the tests are already free because they are covered by pmjay yet uh, this uh, has been put out by malini isola i will credit her with this because i got it off her feed she is the co convener of the all india drug action network and she said that in haryana the government reimbursement rates to private labs for testing government samples is 3500 in haryana tamil nadu 2500 karnataka 2250 gujarat 2000 delhi 4500 and the suggestion is that for the same test how are different governments pricing it differently in reimbursing the private sector so a suspicion is there that why is it cheaper in this state and why is it not in that state a how is it priced b 
how do you incentivize private sector to look out for the PMJY covered people, even though the payment may or may not come late, if at all? So, you know, you raise so many questions at the same time. Let me just try to put it in sequence. So the problem, basically one, is that what you raised, what you started with was that trust deficit. And you are seeing it right now on the panelists also. It is true today that the private sector has really, really come forth in this fight towards COVID. If you were to, if any one of them was on the panel, what we discuss on a daily basis, how to solve this problem along with the government, how to assist the government, it's a national war. It has got nothing to do with government or private. So the basic thing first is to mentally break down that barrier, that big silo wall that we have between government thinking and thinking that private sector is, is all, all for profit. So right now, if you look at it, starting 21st of March, we emptied our hospitals because the uh, elective, so-called elective surgeries or treatments should not be done, you close down. It was, I think, in good intention that maybe so many COVID patients would come that the hospital should be empty if they come and they should not be patient. So we have today about 17 to 20% of the patient load that we normally carry for our patients. Okay. At the same time, COVID did not break out and we just thank God for that. So the hospitals are lying empty basically. All private hospitals are working at 15, 20%. Our revenues are down to 20% or less across the board, across the country. Some nursing homes have shut, shut down, but that's a different story. So if you look at our sector, our manpower cost, which is six employees per bed, is anywhere around 50 to 55% of your total budget. It's not, not like some of the other industries which have 12%. 20% max I've ever heard of is 25%. We are over 50%. Okay. We don't want to let go of them because one, it is morally wrong. The second is that we have to get back to serving people. So we need, need this is where it will come back from. Okay. So today what we are doing, what the first thing we requested was we are the only industry where we have not asked or begged for any uh, grant. As private providers, we said we have a gap of X. So we have we have calculated there is a gap, or we will be losing money collectively, collectively about eight to ten thousand rupee uh, crores a month, just because of loss of revenue. Okay, it may be eight, it may be ten, doesn't matter. What we have said is that the government through all their schemes, and Sujata is very familiar with it, this is a battle which is going on forever, and, and I don't know, she, she has insight into it, I don't. That the government still owes us over 5,000 crores to the hospitals, Across which the is money which they, for whatever reason, some, some will say the bill was not right, this, or whatever. It's, as far as I'm concerned, they've written a contract to say, we will pay you 70% on presentation of the bill and the rest of the 30% will come or not come depending on the accuracy of the bill or whether it passes or not, which was fine. Till today, it has never happened. So there are, we are, so, so we requested the government in the, in about 10 days ago and to, to the finance minister, to so-and-so, to so-and-so, but finally action took place that in April, uh, I took a survey around of all the hospitals, about 20% of our dues have been paid. Now we are requesting the government, please pay the next, because we requested pay 50% at least right now, so that we can survive. So please pay, pay the next 30% for May. These are old bills for months and years, it's not like yesterday. Pay that 30%, we will survive on it, at least be able to pay our people and not have to fire people. Second, make credit, we are willing to borrow. You're saying, please let us borrow at a lesser rate because 8, 10, 12 percent, if you're a small hospital, is 12 percent. If you're medium size, it's about 10, 11 percent. If you're high up there in the, in the credit rating, it may be 9 percent. So we are saying, please make funds available to us at the rate of 5,000 crores a month at 5 percent. So you're not going to lose anything. 
maybe one percent, not half a percent of interest from the government's point of view, but it will give us huge breathing space for these next two, three months where we need to, one, serve the COVID patients and to ramp up to see, you know, what's the tragedy today? The non-COVID patients are dying at home yes. without getting access to care. So, we're, so this that. whole thing is turned lopsided. So what we said was we have made all our hospitals non-COVID so that the non-COVID patients can come and feel safe and they get their treatment because people have died of heart attacks, liver failure, kidney failure, well, you name it. People, gallbladder turning, septic. You know, people are, this is a very big tragedy that's happening on the side where there is no visibility to right now, but it will come to the fore. Uh, so what, what's happening is, so we are saying, just help us to tide over. We don't want any, we, there is no begging bowl here. Like you have to subsidize the poor for food and all that. There's no subsidy like that. Just give us interest rates of 4 to 5 percent. Give us three months, like you've done moratorium on, on EMIs. Just give us a moratorium on paying, paying our electricity bills. Because again, 12 percent of our expense, which is not heard of in, in any other industry, is our electricity bill. Because our air circulation has to be very high and it takes a lot of energy. And we are 24 7 and everything is on 24 7. So that's are only three requests right now that we will be able to survive, we will come back, just help us with these three. And things. how have these requests been met? And how unreasonable is that? I know, to PMO, to AHA, so MHA, everybody, finance ministry, this is going on. And uh, so, nothing yeah, has you happened. Still haven't, but I just told you, you the only it, thing that did help us was that 20% has been paid, which is nice. I, and I thank uh, whatever it has made many people survive, which is good. But if you look at it, there is on a daily basis a request is going, but there is no response yet. But anyway, we will survive. So the second thing is that we will also serve the people. Every city has now COVID hospitals being converted by private hospitals. So that's incorrect to say that we will come forward. It has already happened. Okay. Now, you're talking about how the money will come. So, as I said, there is no precondition here. The only thing is because we know the government is saying, okay, maybe we'll cover them with PMKY or the local state government rates. I mean, they are very low as compared to what the cost of taking care of those patients are concerned. But we can bear that by our own resources or by resources that people contribute from our own CSR, from all. So, there is no... You must, if you look at it, I think that it's a fair thing to say that the uh, that the private sector has responded very responsibly. Now, the people who are cheating are not doctors or healthcare providers. Now, healthcare providers have put their life on the line because they are exposed to life and death situation serving these patients. Anything to distract from that, I think, is a sin. Yes, there are unscrupulous businessmen or people, whoever they may be of any profession, who have done criminal activity by trying to get uh, uh, to sell uh, to the government, to sell to private sector, these fake kits, all this you see, the scam, I was seeing the scam on India today, then you know this uh, the, uh, yeah, sting operation, you can, your sting operation. I mean, this is dismal, that in a time like this, that the character, is, is still not coming out. We, so it's very there. But leave that alone. Private sector is ready. We have put ourselves, exposed ourselves on a daily basis. Even everybody is going to work, seeing patients, COVID patients, so and so. And we are putting our best foot forward. I think the government just needs to recognize that. The public needs to recognize that. We need to bring the non-COVID patients back into the system. And, and I think we would have a good, robust response to coronavirus. This Let's is my specific question before I move on. And you know, if you could just briefly give me the answers to both, they're very specific. One is, you know, the numbers that I quoted that different states are reimbursing uh, labs. Now, I don't know, uh, I know yours is not a lab, it's a hospital, but maybe you are equipped to answer this question that. How is it that the Delhi government is reimbursing uh, private labs at 4,500? Karnataka is doing it at 2250, Tamil Nadu is doing it at 2500. Um, what could the reason for this be? And secondly, while you said, okay, first answer this question, I'll give you the rest. Okay, yes. that's it.
See, ICMR actually did a, a breakdown analysis of the whole cost. And it is true that the cost of just doing the test, no matter where it's done, is 3,500 plus. If you're going to get a, a kit, which is not made in the backwaters of some lane in China, if you get the decent test, it's 3,500. It costs the government also to do that. There's no confusion in that. Then the question was, when the private lab will be collecting samples from home, they'll be using a PPE, the guy will travel there, he has to discard it after every test, it's going to come down to 4,000, 4,200. So giving them a margin of two, 300 for overheads, 4,500 was established by ICMR, not by anybody else. It was not a free market. Some states, and this is where the tragedy of India lies, some guy who wants to please the boss will say, sir, they are making too much money, make it less. So the boss says, okay, make it 2,500 from tomorrow. This happened in UP. Okay. We have a hospital. We, it's not a, a non-COVID hospital, a big hospital. But we would still test people if they look suspicious when they're coming in for surgery or other things. And the private lab, there was only one private lab who was servicing our, our patients. This, the lady said, I'm not doing it anymore. I can't. I can't be so, uh, losing uh, uh, a thousand and a half on, on, okay. on the stage. So this was then kicked up to the super boss, to, to Yogi Ji. And we also spoke. And he understood it in five minutes. And he said, I, I think this is a bloody uh, not thought through uh, decision. Please reverse it. If the ICMR has said that there is a, the rate should be this, then they have applied their mind to it. Okay, now there was a PIL in the Supreme Court to say, make it free for everybody. Okay, make it free. Nobody's opposed to that. But then the private lab said, and I, we are not a private lab, but I'm talking about being aware of the situation. The private lab said, fine, give us the kits. Give us the whole thing. We will do it free. We'll contribute that 500 or 1,000 rupees from our side, but we can't buy the kits and say, let's, let's do what we have to do. This is to supplement the government's effort. So what you're saying is that that price differential is ad hoc. There is no logic to that. Someone exactly. No, it is it is mindless. Okay. Because okay. of the fact that ICMR is not a body sold to private private people, it is a well known fact what the cost is. So this was done after a lot of deliberation. So uh, I don't think there is any question there. There was a second question you had. Uh, well, that was to do with uh, I know uh, I'll, both you and Mr. Rao need to answer that. Given what you have just told me, what is the incentive for private parties to go into a PPP model? I mean, if you haven't been paid for years, are we just trying zero, to... Zero incentive because the rates, CGHR, CGHS rates have not been uh, uh, renewed from the last uh, five, four years. Okay. The cost of delivery has gone up 40% in the meantime. The CGHS rates were always half of the private rates. The many hospitals don't take it, but we think it's a moral obligation if some, a government servant has served his life to serve the country, that we should still take care of them. But we are doing it at half the price and not being paid is a situation which is bad. So there are people there who understand it. I don't know what the problem is, but at least this crisis has brought out 20%. Hopefully 30% will come now and we will work on it later because we are on the verge. I'll tell you, many, many times we have had to convince the hospitals that please take on, the government is going to take action, please take on then. But uh, till now it hasn't happened, but this crisis has made a little bit of difference. But the whole idea focus is to actually fight till it's our fight. See, we can't be uh, dilly-dallying on anything. Sure. We have I, to do I, it. Absolutely. And, and the decisions have to be made in somebody's luxury office. It's not only made by the, look at the doctors, how they were. Now the, the Home Minister finally finally did the pass the law of protecting the healthcare doctors. Yes, we have seen it, a lot of it, yeah it, after it, it, after it, a lot sure. of protests. Yes, so it's happened. These are the kind of things you need to talk about right now and say let us oil the system so that the army can fight. If the army is starved, we will have a major problem. So, uh, uh, I think, uh, I want to ask Ms. Rao about this incentive. How do you incentivize it? But before I do that, Roman, you want to make a short point about what you said? You raised yes, I mean, uh, Dr. Trehan is right. But, uh, uh, I mean, 
uh, at the government scheme rates, uh, I mean, uh, uh, participation in a government uh, insurance scheme cannot be the cannot be part of the main business plan of a, a, a city hospital uh, in a metro. But what makes sense uh, uh, for 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 these hospitals is that they have uh, occupancy rates of around sixty to seventy percent. There is some unused capacity, and government schemes are bulky. The, 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 the trickling in of patients is regular. So that is, the, I mean, the, there is no business case for participating in uh, 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 government uh, uh, schemes, at least in the metros. So that is an additional point that I wanted to make. This is uh, 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 hospitals, uh, I mean, spending their CSR money or using their uh, 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 excess capacity, unused capacity that is lying for, idle otherwise. For no, no, that's my, that has been my proposal, actually speaking, to the government that yes, let us utilize all the capacity which is available in the private sector and the, and the government sector across the board. The only thing you need to assure is that you pay because if you're doing the service at half the price and you're cross subsidizing it, at least that financing it should not cost you more. That's right. all. Now, Ms. Rao, if you could just tell me about this, you heard what Dr. Trayan said. So, I mean, he didn't mince his words and he says there's zero incentive to, you know, work with the government. But in other models, especially like I said, during the PPV models of, you know, the UPA times, whether it was to do with the industrial houses or, you know, uh, SEZs, they were land grabs. PPV became a bad word then, not because the government didn't trust the private party, the private party didn't trust the government. They seem to trust each other just fine. But those PPP turned into land grabs. Land was bought, projects never started, the jobs that were assured never came. So clearly in healthcare, there is a distrust from the private party towards the government. Generally, PPP had become a bad word because there was distrust of the arm army towards both parties. And the government is the most powerful entity in any equation. How does one overcome this trust deficit? You have had such an illustrious career with the government and specifically with healthcare. How would you recommend we can make this work? Look, there are a couple of issues that uh, I think uh, need to be clarified. And one of them is you'll, you will never find in no country in the world, maybe Germany or some social democracies like that, uh, no country in the world are the private sector ever happy with the government rating uh, you know, with the government rates that are offered. In America, it's a constant fight where Medicare pays uh, to the private, everywhere, the care provisioning is all private in the US. You've and, written uh, all this about insurance also in your column, I've read yeah. about insurance. Same, okay, so in America. In Japan, where there's only one single payer, that's the government of Japan, they have a budget. Within that budget, the rates are fixed. The, doc the medical uh, community has no choice. Of course, they negotiate. But that's it, they have to take what is given to them and they are called administered prices. So nowhere in the world uh, will you ever find a, a, you know, a quotient of satisfaction between what government pays because the, the objectives are two different. Government wants to minimize its financial outgo. The private sector wants to maximize the financial earnings. So these are two different you know, opposite uh, objectives. So this carries on, this dialogue carries on and we keep going up and down. But the pro what I feel is in this whole business, there must be a much more transparent way of setting prices. And there must be a process of negotiation. Because while I do agree with Dr. Tehran, Tehran there are actual costs being incurred by the private sector, which needs to be recognized by the government. But at the same time, the government also has its own pricing. I mean, they, they're also looking at the market prices. And there is a tendency of the private sector to maximize their profiteering on, on uh, healthcare. And so there is this trying to find the balance where you get to a fair price. It's a very tricky, very tough thing. Germany, they spent days negotiating the rates. So that kind of process needs to be started here also. And when it comes to the testing, how is ICMR? I mean, you know, Dr. Trehan knows everyone in Delhi, knows the whole system better than I do probably. But I don't see any health economists in, uh, or cost accountancy or tariff rating expertise in ICMR. I don't know how did ICMR uh, fix rates. I, I have worked in the Ministry of Health for 25 years from 1988. I have never seen or looked to ICMR to fix rates. That's not their job. 
So that surprises me how this is done. And you do have an Ayushman Bharat, you have an NHA. They do have systems of fixing uh, rates and how to uh, do the economics of it. They should have probably done that. That's one point. Let us also assume that, uh, you know, 4,500 is a rate. Uh, so Dr. Trehan said 3,500 is probably the cost of the kit itself. And the rest of it is the administration of the test. If that is so, and if I was in the government, I'd buy a procurement of the kits and give it to them. I'd give it in kind rather than cash. Because everyone knows that when you buy in volume, in bulk, and this is not one, I can cite at least 100 examples to show you when you buy in bulk, the prices fall. Absolutely, sure. Okay, so that's simple economics. It doesn't need rocket science to understand the basic demand supply curves and the balancing of prices. So, uh, so there, if government was in it, then they should buy the kits and maybe, maybe they can get it even at 1,500 rupees, in which case the test kit uh, price will fall. So I think that's how it should have been done rather than come with a fa flat fee of 4,500, which may not necessarily have any basis for it. For example, in Andhra, they're using the TrueNAT RT-PCR test and the t test kit costs 2,000 rupees. And they're saying that they, the specificity and the quality is as good as any other. So, you know, the prices will change. When you say, why does it change from one grade to another? Yeah. Uh, there was that little bit of... Uh, Confusion, I might say, uh, I won't even say transparency, but a bit of confusion as to how this rate was. So you're saying the tests uh, are different in each of these states. It's a different. Yeah. So, so I'm saying there is a methodology. There are proven ways in which rate fixing is done in different countries. We should learn from those experiences. In India, it's very crude. CGHS does it by a tender system. And the, whoever is the L1 gets the rate. That's not the way anyone does rate L1 fixing. L1 for an audience is the lowest one. So you put yeah. it whoever gives the so lowest rate gets that's, it. That's the way CGHS rates <laughs> to get fixed. Doctor. Yeah. And then the prices of our services also vary between Dr. Trehan's prices will definitely vary to a, a Mufasil hospital, a small 30-bed hospital in Baishani district or something. Because the price of inputs will definitely be different in a metro hospital of Delhi or Bombay, where the land value, you know, the price of just the land estate yeah, itself is so high. So everything. so everything, everything varies. So, you know, we have to have a much more sophisticated system of price rating and fixing. That's the one point. Then the second point which you've been asking is government trust. The point is it's not a question of trust, Avinandan. It's all a question of budgets. Look at our GDP today. The estimates are 0.78% GDP. In this kind of a situation, where is a question of them going to be able to give money for health sector? As you know, in any uh, planning, if you say, you know, the 20 lakh crores or 50 lakh crores that is spent, 50% is shaved off for the liabilities that the government has whether it's pensions, whether it is uh, loans taken or whatever. So therefore, the, the, unless and until there's a whole financial taxation reform and the real money in terms of government doesn't grow, their ability to increase but health spending is also heavily circumscribed. That does not mean that once you get into an agreement with any private party that I will pay you this upon performance of a budget, you manage on that. Sorry, I fully agree with the private sector uh, that once government has said, I will pay you X, then you have must to pay within the 10 days or whatever time limit they've set themselves. There is no excuse on that front. I mean, sure. that I fully agree. And that's not acceptable. Before I go to Umen, Doc, you want to just respond to the pricing bit? Because, uh, you know, no, I, no, I, they see what I'm saying is we are all aware of the only one I word that I objected to what uh, Sujata was saying was profiteering. First, if you say profiteering, you should be able to prove it's profiteering. You can't accuse people of profiteering because where is the profiteering? They should come in to look at the account and say how close to the ground the private sector is, is cruising right now in healthcare. Okay. There, are, there, are, there is much that's going on. There is that's a good. word used but normally. Sure. No, no, no. This is a mindset of the government which I object to, and I. This is what I'm trying to say. You should. Uh, you're in the private. Uh, you're a private citizen now. You should come and uh, and engage with us because you're a voice. 
you should see it. That woman right. also come and see. In Let fact, you do the this, pricing. Maybe the, this Let you do the pricing. And where can you say you can do a cesarean section at 9,000 rupees? You can't. Right. You can't. But anyway, how do you, anyway, anyway, how anyway, do you anyway, charge? That's not my jack. But let me just, uh, one way, I do agree, Dr. Trehan, that I, I have written articles also on this. The uh, rates fixed by Ayushman Bharat are unrealistically low. Unrealistically low. I hope you would listen. Dr. Trehan, I agree with you. Unrealistically low. I'm not defending the 9,000 rupees that uh, Ayushman Bharat is giving C-section. I'm not at all saying that. All I'm saying is that there has to be a process and there has to be an agreement between the private sector and the government rate fixing to say, okay, this is fair enough. Agreed. We can never reach a full satisfaction, but there must be a consensus and there must be an agreement. You cannot have uh, uh, arbitrary fixing, which right. is what Aishman Bharat has done, which is not okay. right. Now, Oman, you've heard both sides. A, yes. pricing, how does it happen in different parts of the world? And honestly, I still haven't, at least I'm not walking back from here convinced that there is any trust, as, at least as far as healthcare is concerned, between the government and, and uh, the private parties. I mean, how do you expect to make a PPP model work in this space? I mean, in real estate, it works just fine. But here, it clearly doesn't. No, I mean, in the health sector, uh, uh, I mean, there are too many uncertainties. Uh, right now, I mean, the 4,500, uh, like uh, Sujada Mam said, Bulk purchases are one way of reducing costs. But a private entity will think twice before making a bulk purchase. I mean, we don't know. We have been very lucky. The numbers have been low. Say somebody commits to the government that they will conduct a test at uh, 1,500. And they go and purchase I mean, they have to pay in advance. A, a huge number of kits. And then our luck continues. And there aren't too many cases. What happens to them? So they will not make the bulk, bulk purchases. It should be in, in an emergency. It should have been the government which, which should have taken the initiative, made the purchase at a low cost and distributed them to the private entities. Unfortunately, our COVID response is mostly reactive and is not well thought through. We have been firefighting from the beginning. So uh, that is one. And, and secondly, I mean, uh, there is this uh, fact that uh, uh, there is deep distrust, mistrust of the private sector within most Indians. I mean, we are probably the only country in the world, only major country in the world, which was ruled by a private company for, for, for ages. Yes. So that mistrust is there and that needs to be dealt with. And secondly, a reasonable profit is not a very bad thing. Uh, and that also needs to be accepted. Otherwise, why would a private entity be in the business? Sure. And a reasonable profit is not what is going on uh, in, in, in many parts of the private sector within healthcare. That is another matter. What do you mean? Private, it's, it's, uh, you mean there's a super normal profit being made? A, I mean, yes. I mean, in, 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 in pockets, of course, yes. It is lightly regulated, as I said earlier. And I mean, like... Uh, 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 Sujada Ma mentioned, the profiteering is a word that normal people use. Uh, once uh, uh, they have had one of these experiences with a hospital or uh, a, a lab or a, 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 a doctor, I mean, uh, uh, this is a fact. But the fact remains that uh, although private sector has its problems, we need to fix them. Maybe this is not the time to fix India's healthcare sector. It is a national emergency. We'll have to find a way of working with the private sector because they have enormous resources which are right now uh, mostly shut down. We'll have to bring back them online. We will most likely need them in the next week. Is there any data with any think tanks as to how PP models, PPP models work in the healthcare space as opposed to in other spaces in different parts of the world? Is it Similar PPPs within healthcare sector, I, I mean, it, healthcare has a, a problem of asymmetric information. So uh, most of the information that passes hands are mediated. I mean, you would never know. And, and the entities are very, very cagey about sharing their costs. So uh, 
and, and and also from the other side if you have a 100 bedded hospital you cannot have this cag model of uh, projecting revenue 100 into 3000 per day i mean they have 60 percent occupancy on the average maybe it is less maybe it is slightly more in in, in certain months so uh, you will have to i mean both sides will have to meet somewhere midway the okay. ideal economics doesn't work in healthcare Mr. So, Rao, you were saying, I think that's a very important point that Ruman has said that just economic theory, the way we understand it, doesn't work in healthcare because the, the human angle, whether it is the input, output, or even the satisfaction and the trust, is significantly higher in healthcare as opposed to buying a bar of soap or you know. And also, your decision to buy is 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 mediated by a doctor. And it's not voluntary. It's yeah. circumstances determine it. I'm not yes. you know buying. I want to buy a car now. I don't want to buy a car now. If my heart needs. Bypass, it needs bypass. I mean, I, I can't. Do okay, it. let so, me please, answer. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, uh, yeah, please uh, answer that. And also, um, specifically on this whole L1 logic, it's been there in the government for the longest time. What will it take to overcome that way of tendering? Okay, that's an easier question. And then I'll go to the other one. The L1 business is something that has been of great concern to everyone. Uh, to say how can we get out of it because we really get it cheap but we also get bad products. I mean, to put it really loosely, huh? not like that, but uh, for example, if I have attended for a microscope, I will probably get an X type of microscope which is L1, but I do know that the German microscope is a world standard. It is definitely much better, more reliable, but it is, you know, uh, uh, the second most expensive. Now I have to then do a massive amount of justification why I don't want L1 and I want to get a German. And nobody wants to take the risk because in hindsight after five years, they'll say I, had, I got a cut from there. So the solution that is often given by the CBC and other agencies, then you set your standards where only German type of microscopes alone can tender. So you stiffen your uh, prerequisites and requirements when you should tender for. So that is what is now happening because our experience in the government has been in the health sector that the L1 doesn't get you quality. And uh, in health, quality is absolutely topmost uh, necessity. Right. You know, whether it's drugs or whether it's equipment right. or whatever it is. So that's where the debate is, but no one, no bureaucrat would uh, stick his neck out, for example, to not give an L1, unless he has a very, very strong uh, evidence base to prove then the L1 is a crook by, you know, whatever it is. Right. Now you see how ICMR imported uh, kits. Yes. They must have validated the first round of kits and that's how the import order was given. But then when you see it in the field and they sent it out, they've turned out to be hopeless. Right. This is where the trust deficit comes. Now that's a private player who showed you good tests, got himself accredited, got the tender and then supplies rubbish to you. So when it comes to trust deficit, the whole genesis started in the 90s when India started opening up to the private sector and they started giving land for as an incentive to want you to set up hospitals. Apollo, Pratap Reddy was the first one to set up Apollo in 86 uh, when Indira Gandhi was very impressed by uh, the technology that he brought, the whole modern way of uh, hospitals, you know, uh, functioning and so on. So with that, land was given in Delhi, it was given in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, so land became something which was very expensive for private sector to buy. And uh, uh, government giving it meant it was a very big incentive. The second incentive they gave was custom duty exemptions for importing equipment. Because Rajiv Gandhi wanted top class equipment to be made available here. There was an internal demand for high quality care because there was a rising middle class. And so they gave custom duty waivers. Now, in both these uh, things that the government gave, they put a condition which I think was a bit tough. And that was not done through the health ministry. It was done by the finance ministry without consultation with the health, saying that 40% of outpatient should be done free. 40% of outpatient treatment every day should be done free of cost. In perpetuity. Yes. And 10% of inpatient beds should be done free. In perpetuity. Now, you may be uh, importing an equipment for, say, 5 lakhs of rupees. In a year's time, if you have uh, really implemented this sincerely, you would have 
done the, you know, paid back the custom duty, you should be free from that, right? But when it made it perpetuity, after 20 years, people started, you know, naturally no private sector adhered to the guideline at all. And once when the Delhi government had an inquiry on uh, one of the top hospitals yes. in Delhi, they okay. said, they said that, you know, we were asked to provide 10% beds, not treatment. So here are the 10% costs. Let your patient come and buy, but we will charge. But that is not the spirit of it. You know, when you took it literally, because, so that's what I mean. Private sector, as long as you have it, you have to be fair to them. You can't expect them to be a charitable organization. The profiteering part, which Dr. Trehan was upset, uh, that came in is, you see the kind of unnecessary surgeries they do. The kind of number of stents that they put when it's not required to put the stents. Now, this, these characterizations that I'm giving you is not peculiar to India at all. If you, read, if you read United States, uh, you open yeah. any health economics book, there will be chapter and verse. In fact, in the US, the opioid crisis is being blamed on. Absolutely. Doctor. Yeah, unnecessary test done, unnecessary diagnosis, uh, pushing them for drug. surgeries, unnecessary surgeries. And you remember Amir Khan did even a whole series on TV on the corruption, yes. the kickback culture that's there. That's true. Now, Dr. Trehan is too find a person to accept it, but the, really the world of uh, private healthcare is very dirty. I mean, there's so much of kickback in which our government fellows are also involved. Uh, you know, you refer to a lab, you get a kickback, you don't. So these kind of things, the whole system of healthcare in India is unfortunately quite corrupt. And we all know it, we know it. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, this whole business of trust deficit comes in because you don't know what they're doing. Is this diagnosis really correct? Is this appendicitis really needed? Has the stents really been put? You know, this kind of doubts, if you begin, you can't work. Maybe the answer so, to the question... So this will change. It will have to change. Uh, even the health sector is now beginning to understand. But it's a process, and I think it'll take time. But the whole, the judd of the problem, as I said, was when they reneged on conditions given to them, they should represent it. But you don't go back on a condition given. Sure. And when, when the system of this kickback culture, which is peculiar to India, started, uh, it really, uh, the trust deficit by the people and, uh, uh, you know, government. So you remember, Fortis treated somebody for 15 days and charged them 16 lakhs of yes. I Actually, I can bet you that if you do a costing, if not 16, it will cost maybe 14 lakhs, 13 lakhs, you know. ICU is not cheap. Uh, it does cost money. But look at the way public reaction was. Yes, absolutely. And it's, you, it's, you must have also said, Sona lakh for just 15 days. So, you know, this lack of transparency and the huge amount of opacity that is there in this whole pricing of services is where the trust deficit is really... In, in, a, in a sense, the answer that has emerged, and Uman, I'll give you the last word, and hopefully you can give us some prescription because we look at think tanks to solve problems, uh, uh, e e even if they may be, uh, uh, you know, we are asked not, not not entirely uh, agenda free. But I think uh, one minute, Abhinandan, Abhinandan, yes. just one more point. Yes, there is the PPP in health is very limited, very limited. It's not. Uh, a very huge amount. I mean, you can't say I give a private dhobi laundry is PPP. That's not PPP. Sure. Or a uh, kitchen in the hospital okay. is given by private contractor. That's not Understood. PPP. Understood. Uh, so you and I understand what PPP is. That's very limited. It has not grown very much. So that is what, and there is Dr. Venkatram, who is an authority written on public private partnerships in health. So that's the only book I know. But Which maybe we should book. speak with him as part of the series because we are going to be doing a series on yeah, this. Yeah. Um, so, Uman, sorry I took your question. No, no, but I just want you to that's finish. fine. But I think one answer that's emerged is that healthcare is unique, that there is a self-audit happening to the PPP model. That, you know, just like when I said in, in case of the whole SEZ thing and the whole you know, industrial push of Manmohan Singh wanting to unleash the animal spirits of the market, there was no daily audit. In healthcare, there's a daily audit happening, if not by the CAG, but by the people who are going to the hospital and coming back. This is how much I paid. I was killed. I haven't been treated. I haven't been done this. Because this daily audit that happens with the participation of the user is unique to healthcare. And I don't think that is unique to any other industry, whether it is an auto part setup 
or it is you know set up for some machinery parts being made or chemicals being made or petrochemical byproducts being made so clearly that is one thing that has emerged but is it even possible and finally if you could just give us what you think is a possible solution i mean if you could leave our audience with you know some hope and i've always wanted to ask this hospitals are an ecosystem by themselves you know a hospital will have a university there'll be chemist shops there'll be rickshaw walas there'll even be beggars there there'll even be you know an ecosystem emerges around a hospital hospital university you need teachers you have students you have fees being paid if there are students there'll be night clubs there'll be hot spots there'll be dhabas what stops the government from making one aims in every state i'm sure the cost of that will be less than a statue or the central vista project they're making and yet, they're that making is, that is happening that's happening that's happening why, why did it why did it take so long for something so elementary to emerge so health and starts. education have been neglected areas i mean it's a fact post uh, uh, post uh, uh, independence these have been neglected so uh, i mean uh, to to put it in perspective what america spends on health uh, uh, as a percentage of their gdp is india's total tax gdp ratio i mean whatever we uh, uh, whatever the government of india earns as tax if we spend the whole amount on health we will be equivalent to the us so uh, it is it is it is in in the us it is private sector driven uh cost escalation but it is a fact that uh, cutting edge health technology costs money and we really desperately uh, uh we scored desperately low uh, uh on on that count we 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 should at least spend the double of what we are currently spending before our public sector is is has a minimum quality benchmark i'm i'm talking about this for a reason if there is a well functioning public sector that brings in an implicit regulation into the sector if the public sector is giving uh, uh healthcare uh, uh, services of a certain minimum quality then the private sector will have to bring the cost down and uh, adjust readjust recalibrate their quality then the people have the opportunity to vote with their feet against the public private sector right now it doesn't exist our public sector is starved there is no staff so if you are sick you have you, option yeah if you want to live then you will have to go to one of these facilities and do what the doctor says you and cannot go to clinic to healthcare it yes. that logic doesn't apply to any other industry yes that's right so i in my I, we can we can we can debate it uh, for days but the thing is uh, we'll have to bring uh, the private sector on board with incentives uh, so that they allow for certain amount of self regulation and pmjy is one way of doing it with graded pricing probably uh, uh, some of the concerns of uh, uh, big hospitals like dr trehans will be will be addressed so there are ways of addressing it if it's graded yeah 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 i mean these prices are all right for uh, small cities and towns i mean uh, hospitals like medanta cater for what less than 1% of india's population so public policy cannot run on uh, uh, those models we are talking about smaller hospitals reasonable hospitals common wards we are not talking about uh, uh, care in a in a private room when we are talking about public policy so i think uh, bringing uh, 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 the private hospitals on board as part of a government scheme where they can also make reasonable profit is the only way we can regulate the system and for that the logic for city hospitals will have to be different from a facil town hospitals yes i think uh, the the logic is already ingrained in 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 the guidelines but maybe we need to uh, uh, fine tune it i see but for that we'll have to give the private sector uh, a larger uh, patient pool what i was saying is if we universalize it uh, current 60% plus the 40% for free for this emergency year and the 40% or maybe 20% can pay from next year on a cost basis because it's a government run program it will run smoothly much better than the status quo that is what i think and then the government has a 
foot at the door where they can regulate i mean we shouldn't be over regulating then the whole thing collapses sure but if we want to regulate the private sector we the health is a state subject the center has no teeth i mean mom will know uh, uh, so I, if we if we if, if we have to do it we have to incentivize the private sector in in newer uh, ways otherwise there is no way for okay thank you so much for your time i appreciate it thank you mr rao you can go back to writing your book and your columns uh, thank you uman and uh, thank you dr trehan and we hope you the audience did get something from this something to take back and think about and hopefully a step forward towards more solutions because we know we need solutions more than just highlighting problems thank you thank for watching thank, thank you, you for your time thank you so much bye